Hey, welcome to Vortex Garage. And for those of you who are on our live stream, we want to thank you again for joining and for anyone else who joins up as we go along here. For those of you who are not on the live stream and you're watching this recorded, well, this was an item that we decided to do a live stream of and also go ahead and film. So we're going to make a film of this, which we're going to put up on our channel separate from the live stream with hopefully better viewing angles, better editing, so you can actually see how to do this job. What are we doing today? Well, we're going to be replacing the water pump on this Jeep Grand Cherokee with a 4.7 liter V8. Now changing a water pump on these is actually pretty simple. Now I can start off by letting you know one thing. Whether you have the V8 or the four liter inline six, there are differences obviously in the water pump. Different engine, different water pump. In addition to that, there are different fan setups on the WJ. So some of the uh, inline sixes will use a mechanical fan and I think they also have an electric fan as an auxiliary. And then of course the 4.7 liters, a lot of them use a hydraulic cooling fan, which is kind of a weird thing, which maybe you've never seen before, but it actually is a cooling fan that is run off of the power steering fluid. Um, so it's kind of a neat thing. We should be able to shove a camera down there and show you if you've never seen that. Now that said, um, we're gonna be doing the water pump on the 4.7 liter version, which I think is actually the easier of the two because it has the hydraulic fan. There's no mechanical fan that we have to get off and there's no pulley on the front of the water pump that we have to take off. So it's nice and easy. And uh, one thing we can show you is that it is possible, even though there's not a lot of room here, we can actually finagle the water pump out of here without removing a lot of stuff. So it should be a pretty simple job. So let's start things off. We're gonna show you our tools that we're gonna be using. And uh, for those on live stream, I'll try to stand off to the side so I'm not having my back to the camera too much. We'll do the best that we can. And uh, we're gonna hopefully make this so I don't have to edit too much video as well. That way I'll get it up sooner. All right, so here are the tools that we have for today. So I've, of course, starting off, got a couple lights here, which we're just gonna use mainly uh, to give some illumination for the cameras. We've got a 13 millimeter socket and wrench, and of course a ratchet to go along with the sockets. I've got a standard one, and I've got a deep well. And uh, those are for the bolts on the water pump. I've also got this uh, Allen key ratchet. This is a eight millimeter. And uh, this is used for the uh, kind of coolant, uh, you know, fill plug on the top there. We'll show you where that is. Got a little pair of pliers here because we're gonna open the drain plug on the radiator. And then uh, sometimes they're a little tough, so we use that to get started. Of course, we got a torque wrench. We have a breaker bar to get the serpentine belt off. A half inch ratchet, which you can also use, but there's not a lot of clearance, so I like the breaker bar. Got a couple spare pieces of hose. I like to put these on the uh, drain plug um, outlet on the radiator because we actually have pretty new coolant in here. So we're gonna try to recover that in a clean pan. Got another smaller one in case it fits. Coolant, we've got some Xerox G Geo 5. So not necessarily brand specific, but this is what you can buy in the store that's HOAT compliant. You need HOAT compliant coolant on these cars. Um, if not, you can have a lot of corrosion difficulties and people have actually had their aluminum timing covers eaten away uh, by using the wrong coolant and then you end up with a real mess. So get this, get the Geo 5, make sure whatever you get, if you go to the dealer and get the Mopar stuff, you want HOAT compliant coolant. All right, then of course we have our new water pump, comes with a new O-ring gasket and of course we've got a pair of gloves if we need them and well, that's pretty much it. So that's essentially all we're going to need for this job today. All right, um, so we're gonna get started. Uh, it's been a little while since I've done one of these, so I think the first thing we're gonna wanna do is get the serpentine belt off so we can get to our bolts. So I'll grab this camera here and kind of show you. So our serpentine belt, very simple to remove. And uh, essentially it just sort of wraps around all the pulleys and comes to this tensioner right here. The tensioner has a uh, bolt on it. I think it's a 15 millimeter. So we're going to use this breaker bar because the main reason is I was mentioning earlier you can use a ratchet um, and you can use a wrench but the breaker bar gives you more leverage and it's nice and thin uh, for what you need to get on there. So it is a 15 millimeter and I'll show you with this camera here. There's uh, some of the hoses for the hydraulic fan. Let me try to position this so we can see. So this is also part of the job by the way as we end up moving cameras around just to get the right view. So as you can see, I can slip this on pretty easily with the breaker bar, but anything thicker than that, I'd start to run into this, this uh, hydraulic pipe right here. 
Okay, so basically to get the tension off, we're gonna pull this this way, and that's gonna pull the tension off. Once we have that, we're just gonna go ahead and slide our belt off, and then we can release the tensioner. Pull out our breaker bar, and then just feed the, uh, the belt out. If you don't wanna take the whole belt off, you don't necessarily have to. Um, but I'm going to pull it out because I want to inspect it. And uh, I didn't buy one, so I'm hoping I don't need one. This is not that old. But what you want to do to check them out, you want to flip it over and kind of hold it like this and look for dry rotting and cracking. And you know what? We've actually got a little bit. It's not too bad. It's just on the edge of the, of the ribs, ribs there. But uh, if it goes much further than that, you're going to want to replace. Same on this side. Flip it over, kind of bend it. Look for tears. Look for fraying look for dry rot, things like that. Uh, if you need to, this is the time to replace it. As you can see though, it's a very simple job to pop these off. If this was all you were doing, it's really a, a two minute job to replace this. All right, we're gonna set this one aside. It's good enough to keep using for now. Before we go too much further, we need to drain our coolant because uh, we're actually at the stage where we can start unbolting our water pump. But before we do that, we're gonna need to get the coolant out of the system so we don't drain too much of it all over the place. So first step, I am gonna pop off this right here. Let me make sure we can get a, a view of this on this camera. Okay, so we're gonna start up top and we're gonna open up the uh, plug up here. And this is actually on a 4.7 liter where you fill it with coolant because this is actually the highest spot of the uh, cooling system. So this is an eight millimeter Allen key bolt. Okay, we're just gonna open that up. And what that's gonna do is kind of open it up so it drains a little faster out of the uh, radiator. Okay, let me go dra grab a drain pan. All right, so one little tool that we forgot is our drain pan. We are, we are going to try to recapture the coolant. So we've actually got a nice clean drain pan. This one has never been used for oil. It's never been used for anything else. So if you can keep a separate drain pan just for coolant and keep it nice and clean because you can actually, if you've got brand new coolant in here, this stuff's not exactly cheap it's okay to reuse it. Uh, now, if the stuff's old and you haven't replaced it in a while, now's the time to put some new stuff in the system. We just put this in not that long ago, so we're gonna capture as much as we can and, uh, and go ahead and refill it. Another word of caution, don't forget that coolant is very, very toxic, especially to animals. So if you've got cats, dogs around, anything like that, um, even just a little bit, if they you know, lap some of it up, lick it up or whatever, they can end up getting pretty sick off of it, even kill them. So keep the animals away clean up the mess that you leave because you don't want them getting in it. All right, so we'll put this down here. And uh, all right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go underneath our Jeep. Uh, in case the drain plug's kind of tight, we've got a pair of pliers to help it out. And we've got some hoses to put on the little outlet of the drain. The idea is we're gonna open that up. We've got our nice new clean uh, drain pan that's only used for coolant. We're gonna to try to drain and capture as much as we can. And the reason I use these hoses, I don't want the coolant to pour out and go on the dirty kind of undercarriage where the uh, radiator sits and pick up dirt and debris if I'm gonna be putting it back in the motor. So I wanna run it through these hoses, depending on which size you need. I got a quarter inch, a 5 16 and a 3 8 It's gotta be one of them. So let's see what we can do here. Nice thing about a Jeep, you don't have to jack them up. All right, we'll take this camera underneath and try to show you where the plug is. So the plug should be... All right, hopefully you can see that on this camera. You can see that kind of twist off drain plug and right underneath it is the actual outlet. Now the bad thing is the outlet goes about an inch away from where the frame is, the front frame there. So it's a little tight to get a hose on it, but we're gonna give that a try. So we're probably gonna lose the camera view a little bit. I'm going to try this one. All right, so you can kind of see we've got the hose up on the outlet there, and then we've got the hose routing to our drain pan, and then we're going to open up that drain by twisting that to the left to open it. And you don't have to remove it. You just got to open it. Okay. If I do this without making a mess, it's going to be awesome. 
because I never do it without making a mess. No, I'm making a mess. Well, as you can see, my uh, drain hose didn't quite work all that well. It's leaking out the side of the, uh, the drain plug there, but it's capturing it and it's pretty wiped it down under there. It's pretty clean. So I think we'll be all right. So we're going to let that drain out. And uh, again, we've got some pre-mixed 50-50 that I had left over. And I've got a whole nother gallon of this laying around. So if we need to put new in, we will. All right, that's it for now. I got to let that drain out quite a bit. And, uh, and then we can get started with pulling the actual water pump off. So I really should have had this drain going. All right, so we're still draining out of our radiator a little bit, but we're pretty far gone. So we should be good to go ahead and remove the water pump. Now there is gonna be some residual coolant behind it. So we're gonna to wanna to move our drain pan so that's underneath it so we can catch that. So it sounds like our dripping has subsided. So I'm gonna pop under there and just tighten that drain plug because I think we're done with it. Okay, then I'll move our drain pan. All right, I'm just gonna look down, make sure our drain pan's got good coverage of our water pump. We're good to go. All right, now. All right, so I've gone ahead and closed our drain plug underneath. I've done it by hand, even though we use pliers to open it because they kind of get a little tight. Don't use pliers to tighten it. You can just hand tight it, make sure it's snug. They break pretty easily if you use pliers. All right. All right. So now we're ready to go ahead and get our water pump off. So we've got, uh, just to recap, we've got our serpentine belt off. We've drained our coolant. And uh, now we're free to go ahead and get these bolts off. So we're going to use this 13 inch or 13 millimeter uh, socket. We're going to use a deep well on our ratchet. And we're just going to come along and start to get these taken off. OK, now one thing we're going to do is as I take these off, and I'm just going to start by loosening them first, because uh, once they get loose, they should almost be hand tight at that point forward. Um, but I'm going to actually keep track of where they went, because some of these, if memory serves, are short and some of them are longer. So you want to keep track where each of these bolts went. OK, now this piece right here, there's like a little plastic piece on the top that holds your air conditioning line. That does not need to come off. You should, especially with a deep well, be able to get around it. If you need to, you can use a bit of an adapter and get around it. OK, so let's just get all these loose. We're just going to come along and get all these loose. Oh, I totally forgot. And I know there's someone watching on this that probably knows this. You got to remove the tensioner. I totally forgot you got to get the tensioner off. And I hate that because the tensioners on these things are annoying to take off. Well, they're not that bad. But uh, the issue is, let me show you with this camera. So basically you have a little bit tight to see in there. You can tell it's been a while since I've done this. I essentially do these, by the way, every, every two years. When you buy one of these ones from the parts store, that's about how long they last. But they're free every time you get a new one. And they're not that hard to do. You can hear this one. Hear that? got bad bearings. So you can definitely hear when you run it, you'll hear this as it's idling. That's a telltale sign you're going to have a water pump failure. All right, so this is our tensioner right here. This is the bolt to remove it. And this bolt right here is actually behind this idler. So you could probably get that one with a, with a wrench, but there's one behind the idler, like totally underneath it. So you do have to remove the tensioner. So we're going to come in here and get the tensioner removed and uh, get that out of the way, and then we'll be smooth sailing from there. So I don't remember what size that is. So I might have to update my what tools to get. So it looks like it is a, is it a 13, hopefully. If things like me, it'll be a 13. 
believe it's a 13. So, no. Yep, it is. Good deal. I'll sort of show you as I'm getting this one wrenched off, you can see the whole tensioner assembly move there. So it's really just the one bolt that holds it on. And it's kind of keyed in there too. So it's not a big deal to take this off. Okay. The only problem that you're going to have is what I just did. If you're using a deep well socket or an extension, the uh, hydraulic hoses for the fan get in the way. And uh, then you got to move everything. There we go. Got to ratchet out. Yeah, so don't back it out too far. Okay, now it should be hand tight. We just don't want to drop the tensioner in our bucket of coolant down there and make a mess. There we go. Okay, and I mentioned it was it was keyed. You can see this right here. There's a corresponding kind of bolt under here that this goes over, so that allows you to put it on exactly way you took it off. All right, put this on the workbench. And then we can continue getting our water pump out. Okay, so we got our first one out. I'm gonna basically put that drain pan underneath. I'm gonna look at where it is on our new water pump. Okay, so we can kind of take our new one and uh, line it up. So approximately like this. So I just took that one. Okay, so I'm going to use this to kind of put them in. That way I know exactly what order they came in and out from. Okay, another shorter one. All right, now before we go too much further, and I want to make sure we can see them on this camera. Yeah, you can. These hoses right here have these uh, plastic retainers. I mentioned earlier, you don't have to take a lot of stuff up to get the water pump out, but there's not a lot of room. You got to basically wiggle the water pump out this way and then up through here. So you need all the space you can get. So what I like to do is get these plastic clips undone. That way I can pull these hoses out of the way. So I'm just going to use a flat blade screwdriver, which also wasn't on my tool list. I'll have to update that. Just come in here, pop it, and we'll pop this one. Okay, and then we'll just bend these out of the way, and our hoses will pop out of these plastic retainers, and that allows us to have just a little bit of wiggle room on those hoses. That's all you need, just a tiny, tiny bit. Okay, this bottom one's still a little tight, so let me get it out, and then we're just about ready to pull our water pump. You can hear the uh, nice thing about the O-ring seals on these is they don't stick too much. They're not like uh, classic gaskets that are a real pain to get off and you got to clean them. These usually just come right off. There's no need for RTV on them. So they uh, pop off nice and easy and they do a good job sealing. There we go. All right, here's one of the longer ones. So this is the side that's kind of up on the top. As you can see, this is about twice the length of the other one. So that's why you want to keep these in order. Last thing you want to do is try to crank one of those big long ones down in a spot where one of the small ones is supposed to go and end up cracking your timing cover. So this is the same. You also want to abide by the torque specs because all this is uh, aluminum up here. And these timing covers on these 4.7 liter WJs are a pain to replace. It's a lot of labor to get those off. I had to pull it when I did the head gaskets. And uh, I swear I felt like most of the job was just getting to the point where you could pull the timing cover off. Okay, There we go. You can hear it draining a little bit. Well, more than a little bit. Okay, I'm going to leave that top one in there just a little bit. I'm going to get the last two. So just a trick, you can move the water pump around. If any of these are binding a little bit, it's because there's pressure on the threads. You can sort of move the water pump a little bit and uh, that'll help you get them out. Yeah, we're getting there, another long one. Put that one. Okay. 
Drain all that water out into your pan. Okay, another long one. And our last one. Last one, top one's a short one. All right, now we're gonna let the water drain out. Remember, there's still a fair amount of water in the engine block that doesn't come out when you drain the radiator, so it's normal. And it looks like we're doing a good job capturing it. All right, so there's our water pump off. We're gonna rest it there so we can hopefully see it with the camera. Now what we're gonna do is we just need to basically wrestle this water pump to the left, on, to the passenger side, and then up and out. And there's no, I can't ever remember exactly how to do it. You just have to finagle it, all right? Just a little finagling, then you got it. So I'll narrate it as I'm doing it. All right, so I'm keeping it currently how it's oriented. Now I'm turning it, the base of it, 90 degrees to that way, the left, I guess. And then I'm taking it down to about where the tensioner goes and the front, not about, I don't know if you can see with that camera at all. Let me, let me grab that camera. You know, my hands are getting a little dirty. So you can see I twisted the base this way, about 90 degrees, and then the nut of the front or the bolt for the, where the pulley screws on. Because we took these out, I, I have a little bit of leeway. I can move this hose and kind of get it past there. So that's the idea, all right? And then we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna finagle it. So then off to the side this way. I'm gonna twist this how we need to. And we're jammed up on this bottom hose on the left. So I need to get around that. So I'm gonna move it. There we go. All right, now all I gotta do is get it by our air conditioning line without breaking anything. Look at that, here we go. All right, how's that look on that camera? So, okay, so this is our, our water pump, plastic impeller. We got a little bit of goo under here, which is no good. So maybe I will put the new coolant in just to do. Here's our old O-ring. And uh, of course, we're gonna replace that. It's keyed, so you know where to put the new one. I mentioned the bearings. You hear that, you hear how nasty that sounds and, and you shouldn't be able to do that. So this one wasn't leaking yet, but eventually it would have. Eventually the bearings would have got so bad, if it didn't fly apart, it would just start seeping out of the, the seals and start leaking on you. So that's kind of how these fail. The bearings go bad or they start to leak or the O-ring gives way. Usually the O-rings, I've never had a problem with them. I've more had a problem. This is probably the second one where I've had that go bad. So we're gonna go ahead and get our new one put on. So I'm gonna take this one, just as I had used this to template out where the bolts went, I'm gonna get this one lined up just the same and transfer the bolts. So when I'm assembling the new one, I make sure they go in the right spot. So this is actually the top. And I know that because that's the last one that I took out. Put these here. Put that like that. And that's a good trick to make sure that you always put the right bolt in the right spot. I'll show it on camera here. And you see on this one, nice tight bearings, doesn't make any noise. It rotates nice and smooth, nice and quiet. So this is a Duralast brand. It's a new one. And uh, still, you know, like I said, I, I seem to get about two years out of them and then the bearings fail. Um, I don't know if they'll ever design them a little better. Maybe you can go get a Mopar one and, and have better luck with it, but even the OEM ones I know have difficulty. So All right, we're going to go ahead and put the O-ring in. So we're going to put it in with the angled side up. So that way the, this little piece sits flush here. And then this ceiling piece will compress when we put it in. Okay, and then you'll also have this line up right here. So there's really only one way to do it, which is nice. Okay, all right, so there's our O-ring in. Now, I'm gonna go clean my hands because I don't wanna get too much grease and grime under there. But for now, I'm gonna set this off to the side. Before I go do that, one tip. Go ahead and take a look at your timing cover. Come in here and, and take a look. And uh, I don't know if this is easy to see on this camera, 
but basically you're going to see the inverse of what we saw in the back of the water pump. What you're looking for is any signs of damage. And uh, essentially what, what I mean by damage is, is something called cavitation. Cavitation is probably the worst thing you can have happen to one of these uh, timing covers. And that's usually when you don't use that HOAT compliant coolant and you end up getting corrosion. It actually eats away the timing cover and you'll get a hole. It'll eat a little hole like down in the bottom or off on the side. So essentially as your water pump spins, it just churns the coolant behind it and it doesn't transmit it through the passages. So some people have overheating and they do everything in the, the possible, put a new water pump on, don't notice the cavitation and end up that they needed a timing cover. So it's fixable if that happens, but you don't want to have to do it. The timing covers are a pain. So use that HOAT compliant coolant and uh, you'll never have a problem. So I know there's some people who say, oh, you can use whatever and they won't have an issue and that might be the case. But on these 4.7 liters with these aluminum pieces, I, you got to do what the book says because there are cases out there of people who have had cavitation happen. All right, so we are all set now to go ahead and get our new water pump put on. So as a Haynes manual would say, for those of you who've worked on classic cars with a Haynes manual, uh, reassembly is reverse of removal. So we can end the video here, we're done. No, all right, just kidding. But it really is, it's uh, basically you're gonna finagle in reverse. So that's it. So, all right, here we go. And, uh, okay. There we go. Get that drop down in. All right, just like that. So we're back down here. Now we just need to get it past those two hydraulic hoses. Okay, I got it past the one. Push the other one, got it past the second. So we're home free. Okay, and all the while you do want to be careful that you don't damage that o-ring so although it looks like we're wrestling this thing in here we're doing our best to not push it too hard and uh, wrestle it in there we go just like that okay and we're gonna go ahead and get our top bolt started and then we'll make sure that we do have this correct and that all the bolt holes are going to line up now one thing to remember we're, we're threading into aluminum so you could put a little anti-seize on these, but the big thing that you want to look for is that you're not cross-threading. So they should all go in finger tight. And if they're not, you need to figure out why. Because you don't want to be having to retap one of these holes in this timing cover. Okay, that one's started. Got our first long one, which goes right here. And this will help get our water pump aligned once we get it started. Sorry that I'm kind of in the way, but it's a little bit necessary. Next long one, I'm just gonna go around. Now when we tighten these, we're gonna tighten them in a crisscross pattern so that we put um, the torque values spread evenly across the piece. If we were to just torque them like this, you're basically putting all the clamping pressure on one side and you risk warping it. And then you'll have a lot of leaking problems. They'll literally hand tight all the way to where they start to bottom the water pump out. That's how easy these go in. So if they're not going in that easy, then like I said, check it out. Make sure that you're not cross-threading. All right, these are all hand tight. All right, so this, this will have to be edited in the video. So we got our torque wrench, we got a, a 3 8 torque wrench, and uh, we're gonna set this to 40 foot-pounds, which is apparently the specifications for the water pump. All right, now again, as mentioned earlier, we're not just gonna go around and do a circle with this. We're gonna kind of do a crisscross pattern. So I think we're gonna start on this one is what the book says. I believe this on the left kind of top center is number one. And then we're gonna go down to this lower side one on the right as number two. And then we're gonna go like that, boom, counterclockwise. We're gonna crisscross our way around and then eventually we'll have them all done. 
And then, because I like to double check things, we'll go around it one more time, make sure everything's tight. Now, the book does not call for doing uh, torquing and sequence, not sequence, but like stages. Uh, sometimes you have to do that, like for head bolts often, you'll uh, you know torque to 20 foot pounds and then 40 and then 80 or something like that. This just says go to 40, so that's what we're gonna do. We don't get a lot of throw on these, so you're gonna wanna make sure these are tight a lot. Just finger tight as you can get them. Okay, that's one. Let's go down and do this one. Okay, that's two. And we're gonna go do this lower one. All right, I think that's all of them, but to be sure, I'm gonna go around and just verify tightness on all of them and just take a quick look and make sure, kind of count as I go along count as I go, make sure I got them all. All right, that's it. They're all torqued on, so we're good to go. All right, now we can uh, get our tensioner back on. All right, so we're ready to go ahead and put our tensioner on. Remember, we've got this nice keyed area, so that makes it easy. We'll reverse finagle this under here. Put our bolt in there so we don't lose it. Let's get our keyed area lined up. Oh, I have it upside down. It's great for that, have that key. So I actually just walked over and took a look in the book. It looks like the tensioner is 45 foot pounds on torque. So we'll crank up our torque wrench just a little bit and we'll do 45 foot pounds on this. All right, got our torque wrench. Oh yeah, we got to set this to 45 foot-pounds. So, and uh, they are going to keep me away from the keyboard so I don't mess with anyone's chat messages anymore. And it uh, looks like we're going to have a little bit of difficulty getting the torque wrench situated on there. We're going to need a little bit of an extension. Again, it's a slight tight fit. So I guess I should feel good that so far I haven't broken anything. And I should probably watch my mouth. All right, there we go. So that is torque to spec. And I can wrestle the torque wrench off. So again, that's the pains of doing these jobs sometimes. You gotta find the right setup to give yourself the clearance to get a tool like this torque wrench on. But we got lucky, we were able to get it on. All right, all right. So just to recap where we are for the video that we're gonna edit, um, we've got our water pump on. We've got everything torqued down, the right sequence, and it's torqued to 40 foot-pounds. We've got our tensioner reinstalled and we've got that torque to 45 foot pounds. So at this stage, we're ready to go ahead and get our serpentine pelt put back on and then we can recover our coolant and go ahead and refill the system and check for leaks. So remember, we've already tightened our drain plug on the radiator and I did mention, do that by hand, don't use your pliers on that. I have broken one of those before. So learn from my mistakes, don't use pliers on that. Just hand tight, snug it up, let the O-ring do its job. All right, um, what I will do is our hydraulic hoses, we don't really need these out of the way anymore. So I'm just gonna push these retainers back in, make sure they're in the right spot. And uh, that one's not wanting to go back in just yet. There it goes. All right, so that way we've got everything put back the way it belongs. So let's go ahead and route our serpentine belt. So if you've never routed one of these two often, there's a, uh, well, two things you can do. First of all, you're going to have a belt routing sticker, most likely on your, on your car. It's going to tell you exactly how to route it. If for some reason this is missing or the car doesn't have it, you can usually figure it out. Well, first of all, you can go online and, and find images of it. But generally speaking, just take a look at the pulleys and you can usually figure it out. Any pulley that's ribbed, that means the rib side of the belt goes on that pulley. A smooth pulley or an idler with a smooth surface 
usually has the back side of the belt running, running against it. So that'll give you a hint on exactly how to route these. And uh, generally speaking, they're usually, it's a spot where you can get them on without removing anything, unless the manufacturer really hates you, like Ford on that Mountaineer, in which case it's just a total pain to get it around the mechanical fan. So we're gonna get it on the crank pulley first, and then we're gonna loop it around this idler. So, I don't remember this belt being this tight, and they shouldn't be. They really should slide right on. So, okay. This one's fighting. I was waiting for it. It knew we were live streaming, so it had to do something goofy. But that's all right. That's one of the fun things about wrenching with your friends. They often catch things that you're missing. All right, I got it. So I slid it over the smooth pulley of the water pump. Instead of trying to get it up over the lip, I was able to get it on there. So we're good. So generally speaking, though, I'm usually able to pull the tensioners and have plenty of leeway to go ahead and get the belt on our main setup. So that was a little different. I don't know why this time around it was tough. I mean, you saw taking it off, it popped right off. So maybe that's because the bearings were so loose. It gave us that little extra quarter inch that we needed. Let's double check, make sure we're on all the pulleys and we are looking pretty good. All right, so what we're gonna do, so I'm gonna recapture as much of this as I can, as long as it looks nice. And if it looks gross, then I'll go ahead and uh, use the new stuff. Okay, well, a little over a gallon we're gonna need to put in, and uh, this stuff does look a little nasty, so I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that we have some and uh, go ahead and refill. So there's about a half of a gallon in here. This is new good stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and put fresh in, make sure we have fresh in here. I said you can fill your radiator here. So we'll go ahead and at least fill the radiator this way through the cap, but you're gonna to wanna to actually fill the last bit through that hole there. Cause again, that's the highest point of your cooling system. So, but for the quicker fill, we can go ahead and fill the radiator here. Okay, so I do need to mix a little more. And this is a brand new one that is not mixed. It's... And there we go, it's pretty much filled up. So what I'm gonna do though is let some of the air bubbles work out as it comes up here and you'll see them kind of bubble up from time to time. This being the highest spot, that's what you wanna do. You wanna fill and bleed through this hole. This is like the bleed hole. You can put the cap back on here. You'll see that because I filled here in the highest spot, it actually filled the radiator up to the right level. Um, so it kind of all works itself out. If you were to try to fill the radiator up all the way, what you'll eventually do is, yeah, you'll kind of level it off here and get it as far as you can, but you got to watch it because eventually you're going to get to this hose here, which is the overflow to your overflow tank. And you're going to just start filling that up more so than actually filling the system here. So we're looking pretty good. And uh, I'm gonna put this on. So I feel like we put in a little more than we took out. And uh, I would imagine that our old water pump had was seeping coolant um, while the bearings were bad. It, you could definitely tell a little on it. There was some uh, wetness, signs of wetness. I would imagine we were losing a little bit of coolant as we were driving, not enough to pool under the vehicle. A lot of times that's what you see when things are under pressure that's when they're leaking. That's what people really have trouble grasping. They go, hey, I, I got home and you know, I go out, there's no puddle under my car, but my coolant's low. Where's it going? Well, there's two places it's going. Number one, you got a head gasket problem and you're bleeding coolant and burning it. Uh, but number two, a more common one is you've got a very slow leak that is worse when things heat up and expand. So when you're driving, you're actually losing a little bit and it's just blowing away as you're driving. You go park the car and it seals up as it cools off and you never see a puddle. So that's a good sign, which you can look for. And sometimes you see them under here. There's little white spots. You'll see them on various things. That's dried coolant. You can kind of tell a lot of times if you've had coolant around in here. We've had it in the past. One of the other water pumps that we did was bad enough it was leaking. All right, so we're going to leave the bleed screw off. And our cameras should be out of the way. 
and we have no leaks. Everything is, is in and tight. So I'm going to go ahead and start the vehicle and I'm going to leave this bleed hole open because I want to bleed the system. So what I'm going to allow that to do is spin the water a little bit, push some of the air bubbles out through. I still got my drain pan under there because we're going to have a little bit of drips and drops and stuff like that. I've still got coolant in here and I've got another gallon if we need it. So we're good. So now all I got to do is find my key. Here it is. I know you can see we did have some kind of fountain up like that. That's why we have the drain pan under there. All right, so we're going to top that off. Again, this is why it's critical you keep that drain pan underneath because you're going to have a little bit bubble on, in and out. You're basically pushing all those air bubbles through. And this is a really key step because air bubbles trapped in the system, if you were to cap this off, you can have an air bubble end up in a spot, cause the coolant to not get pushed through and have an overheating situation. So I like to run it, just idle it with this open. You'll see it kind of rise and fall and uh, sort of bubble away. Eventually it'll warm up enough that it'll open the thermostat and you'll get everything out. Uh, looks like I got my air on, let me turn that off. So again, you want to be careful of all the running stuff, but you can see here a little bit of bubbles here and there. It's, it is flowing over, so I've got my drain pan to catch it. You can feel some heat coming into the coolant here, which is good. We're actually doing pretty good. Now coolant expands as it heats up, <coughs> as the water does, so that's why you want to occasionally replace your, your radiator cap, because that actually helps pressurize the system. They, uh, a pressurized system actually raises the boiling point and it's more efficient. So that's why everything is sealed and capped off. And that's one reason why our coolant starts expanding and overflowing as we got it heated up. But this is also driving out those air bubbles. So. Still seeing a couple air bubbles here or there, but they're dying down. So I think we're at a stage where we can cap it off and we'll let it run for a while and test it. Worst case scenario, after it cools off, we'll just crack it open again and we'll run it and we'll make sure all the air bubbles are out. The air will naturally want to gravitate up to the top. The big key is you just want to get it from not being stuck underneath in the system somewhere. And since we did this on a cold motor, all the air bubbles should be on the cold side from where the thermostat is. So. If that opens, it'll be great, but if not, I think we're gonna be excellent on our system here. We can go ahead and thread this piece back in. And snug it down. All right. All right, so that's it for our job. We've got everything wrapped up. Just to recap, we've gone ahead and refilled the coolant. We put everything in through the bleeder, uh, bleeder fill. We uh, ran the system, let it idle, and got all the air bubbles out. We'll, of course, test it, drive it around. We'll keep an eye on our uh, uh, coolant gauge, make sure everything's running good, but we should be good here. Everything's torqued down. Our serpentine belt's back on, tensioner's back on, our hydraulic hoses are on. And like we said, we didn't have to take off a lot of stuff to get this water pump out, so it's not that tough of a job. And uh, hopefully you saw that. And uh, I really hope that as we did the live stream here, we were still able to kind of run the cameras in an efficient way, give you some good views. So hopefully when I do the editing, this turns out pretty good and you all are able to see how to do it. Of course, if you have any questions, hit us up in the comments. We try to monitor those and answer questions as we can. And as we have always said, if there's more video we can shoot on the Jeeps or any other cars that we might have access to work on, let us know. We'll grab a camera, we'll answer some questions and show you some stuff. So thanks everyone for joining. And uh, again, we appreciate you being here on Vortex Garage.